Hello, and today we're going to talk about fashion in 1500. Mm, uh, this is the era that I'm very interested in. It's the Tudor era, where about the Henry Tudor and Elizabeth and Mary and Edward. Um, it's very interesting for me. The type of clothing was uh, so intricate. Um, the girdles and all sorts of things that we can learn from, and I'm very interested in that type of thing. So let's get go ahead and get in, get into this. Um, uh, 1500 to 1550 in Western European fashion. So, fashion period in 1500 to 1550 in Western Europe is marked by a voluminous clothing worn in an abundance of layers. Uh, it's a one reaction to the cooling temperature of the Little Ice Age. Hold on, let me get my glasses on. Especially in Northern Europe and British Isles. Contrasting fabrics, slashes, and Embroidery, apply trim, and other forms of surface ornament became more prominent. The tall and narrow lines of the late medieval uh, period were replaced with a uh, wide silhouette, conical for women with breadth at the hip and broadly square for men with width at the shoulders. Sleeves were a center at of the attention uh, and were puffed and slashed and um, cuffed and turned back to reveal contrasting linings. So this is something that we don't see often these days, which is the sleeve. Sleeves of clothes are not as not an attention grabbing thing these days. It's just a necessity. Coffee here. And um, now we have uh, Henry VIII of uh, England ruled from 1509 to 1547, and Francis I of France ruled 1515 to 1547, strove to host most glittering Renaissance court, culminating in festivities around the field of cloth gold, 1520. But the rising power was Charles V, King of Spain, Naples, and Sicily in 1516, heir to the style as well as the riches of Burgundy and Holy Roman Emperor from 1530. The inflow of gold and silver from the New World into recently united Spain changed the dynamics of the trade throughout Western Europe ushering in a period of increased opulence in clothing that was tempered by the Spanish taste for sombre uh, richness of dress that would dominate the second half of the uh, century. This um, widespread adaptation of Hispanic court attire in Europe has seen as um, was seen as a sign of allegiance to the empire of Charles V. The uh, original variation in fashionable clothing that arose in the 15th century became more pronounced in the 16th century. So, in particular, the clothing of the Low Countries, German state Scandinavia, developed in a different direction than that of uh, England, France, and Italy. Uh, although all acknowledged and the sobering and formal influence of Spanish dress after the mid 1520s. So, <clears throat> linen shirts and chemises or smocks had full sleeves and often full bodies and uh, pleated or gathered closely at the neck and wrist. The 
resulting small frill gradually became a, a wide ruffle and presaging the rough of the latter half of the century. These garments were often decorated with embroidery in black or red silk and occasionally with gold metal threads if the garment was meant to be flashier of the ones in wealth. A bodice was boned and stiffened to create a more structured form and often a busk was inserted to emphasize the flattering and elongating of the torso. Small geometric pattern appeared in the early period and in England evolved into elaborate pattern association associated with flowering of black work embroidery. German shirts and chemises were decorated with wide band of gold trim at the neck, which was um, uniformly low early in the period and grew higher by mid-century. Silk brocades and velvets in bold floral patterns be based on the pomegranate and trestle or artichoke motifs remained fashionable for those who could afford them, although um, they were often restricted to kirtles, undersleeves, and doublets revealed beneath uh, gums of solid-colored fabrics and monochromatic uh, figured silks. Yellow and red were very fashionable colors. Inspired by the mended uniforms of the Swiss soldiers after the country's 1477 victory over the Duke of Burgundy, uh, elaborated f slashing Hmm. Elaborate the slashing remained popular, especially in Germany where fashion arose for assembling garments in alternate band of contrasting fabrics. Elsewhere, slashing was more restrained, but the uh, band of contrasting colors and fabrics called guards, whether in color or texture, were common as trim on skirts or sleeves and necklines. Uh, these were often decorated with band of embroidery and apply applied uh, <coughs> passementary yeah, bobbin lace and rose from passementary in this period, probably in Flanders, and was used both as an edging and as applied trim. It is called uh, Passamain in English inventories. The most fashionable furs were the silvery winter coat of the lynx and dark brown, almost black, sable. Um, so, um, let's look into the woman's fashion first. I believe that this whole video should be would be dedicated for women's fashion because there's a lot to deal with and um, my own source of the era's representation for me only of during this era is that the famous six wives of Henry and that's probably it. <laughs> I do not believe I remember anybody else during that period in the English uh, monarchy. Yes, um, probably I could remember some uh, Turkish uh, Empire, Ottoman period. Probably, they're they're very worth looking into too. The clothing the culture. I would look into that later, another time. So let's look into the um, women's fashion. So let's look into the overview uh, summary of this period. Uh, women's fashion of the early 
16th century considered consisted of a long gown, usually with sleeves, worn over a kirtle or undergown with linen chemise or smock worn next to the skin. The high-waisted gown of the late medieval period evolved in several directions in different parts of Europe. In the German states of and Bohemia, gowns remained short-waisted, tight-laced, but without corsets. Um, the open front, fronted gowns, laced over the kirtle or stomach or placard. Um, sleeves were puffed and slashed and elaborately cuffed, as you can see in all the portraits of the Henry's wives. <laughs> In France, England, and Flanders, the high waist line gradually descended to a natural waist in front, following Spanish fashion, and then a V-shaped point. Cuffs grew larger and were elaborately trimmed. Hoop skirts and uh, farangels. <laughs> I do not know what that is. Is a um, apparently that is one of the several structures used under the Western um, European woman's clothing in 16th and 17th century to support the skirt in the desired shape. It originated in Spain. So this is the hoops of the skirt. It is called farthingales. So th. So, alright. So, next. The hoop skirts had appeared in Spain at the very end of 15th century and spread to England and France over the few next few decades. Corsets also appeared during this period. A variety of hats, caps, hoods, hair nets, and other headdresses were worn with strong um, uh, regional variations. Shoes were flat with broad squared German fashion. So, in the first half of 16th century, uh, German dress varied widely from the costume worn in the other parts of Europe. Skirts were cut separately from bodice though often sewn together and of opened front open fronted gown laced over a kirtle with a wide band of rich fabric often jeweled and embroidered across the bust partlets called in german collars or collars were worn with a low cut bodice to cover neck and shoulders and were made in a variety of styles the most popular collar was a round shoulder capellet, frequently of black velvet lined in silk and fur with a standing neckband. This collar would remain in use in some parts of Germany in the uh, 17th century and became part of the national dress in some areas. Narrow sleeves were worn in early years of the century and were later decorated with band of contrasting fabrics and rows of small uh, panes and strips over the puffed linings. Skirts were trimmed and with bands of contrasting fabrics but were closed all around. They would be worn draped over draped up to dis display in an underskirt. From 1530, elements of Spanish dresses were rapidly adopted in fashionable Germany, Germany under the influence of imperial court of Charles V. And gowns. Uh, let's look at gowns. Dress in Holland, Belgium, and Flanders, now part of the empire, retained a high belted waistline longest. Uh, Italian gowns were fitted to the waist with full skirts below 
I will have to apologize to you that the sounds and uh, the construction noise that is coming outside. I hope that you can concentrate and stay with me during this lesson because this is a very interesting topic for me and I will try to make it as quiet as possible. Um, now let's continue with that. The French gown of the first part of the century was loosely fitted to the body and flared from the hip with a train. Um, the neckline was square and might reveal the kirtle and chemise uh, and beneath. Cuffed sleeves were wide at the wrist and grew wider displaying a decorated undersleeve attached to the girdle. The gown fastened in front early, sometimes lacing over the girdle or a stomacher. The skirt might be slit in front and the train tucked in the back to display the skirt of girdle. As a fitted style emerged under Spanish influence, the gown was made as a separate bodice and skirt. This bodice usually fastened at this side and the other side back with hook and eye or lacing. From 1530s, French and English fashions featured an open and square-necked gowns with long sleeves fitted smoothly over a tight corset or a pair of bodice or a um, skirt hoop. With the smooth and conical line of the skirt, the front of the kirtle or the petticoat was displayed and a decorated panel called the forepart, heavily embroidered and sometimes jeweled, was, uh, was pinned to the petticoat and directly to the uh, skirt hoop. The earlier cuffed sleeves evolved in a trumpet sleeve um, into the uh, trumpet sleeves tied on the upper arm and flared below with wide and turned back cuffs, often lined with fur, uh, worn over full undersleeve that might match the decorated forepart. At the very end of the period, full round sleeve, perhaps derived from um, Italian fashions, began to replace the flaring trumpet sleeves, which disappeared by the later 1550s. Fabric and chain girdles were worn at the waist and hung down to roughly knee length, and tassel uh, or small prayer book or a purse might be suspended from the girdle. The low neckline of the dress could be filled with partlet, a uh, black velvet partlet lined in a white with high and flared neckline were worn, pinned over the gown, and partlets of the same rich fabric of the bodice of the gown gave an appearance of high-necked gowns. So sheer or opaque, opaque linen partlets were worn uh, over the chemise smock. High-necked smock began to appear towards um, toward the 1515. These might have a small standing collar with ruffle, which would become a pleated cuff of the next period. Now let's look at the hat, hat and headgear. In, in France, England, and the Low Countries, black hood with veils at the back were worn over a linen undercap that allowed the front hair parted in the middle to show. These hoods became more complex and structured over time. Unique to England was the gable hood, a wired headdress shaped like a gable of a house. In 16th century, the gabled headdress had long embroidered lapels, um, framing the face and loose veil behind. Mm. Later, the gable hood would be worn over the several layer of 
that completely concealed the hair and the lappets and uh, veil would be pinned up in variety of ways. One of the most important gable wood uh, hood figures of Henry's wives or the first wife, Catherine. Uh, she uh, she has that portrait, uh, the very distinctive portrait of that gable hood. Mm, yes, and uh, a simpler rounded hood of the early years of the century evolved into French hood. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, popular in both France and England, its arched shape set further back in the head and displayed the front hair which parted in the center and pinned up in braids or twists under the veil. How uh, the, the, in those times you see uh, a slight hair showing in the front, it was like a tease, it was not heard of because of the gabled hood, it was uh, hair was completely tucked and away from the face, uh, from the crowd. So it was unheard of when the French fashion took the French hood. So um, famously worn by my man Henry's second wife, Anne Boleyn. And uh, yes, so German woman adopted hats like fashionable men's beret. Early in the century, uh, these were worn over caps and collets made of netted cards over the silk lining. Hats became fashionable in England as an alternative to the hood towards the 1940s. Close-fitting caps of fur were worn in the cold climates. A linen caps called coifs were worn under the fur cap, cap hood a warmer climate, including Italy and Spain, hair was more often worn uncovered, uh, braided, twisted with ribbon and pinned up and confined in a net. A spine, uh, Spanish style in the later 15th century was worn in this period. The hair was puffed over the years before being uh, drawn back at the chin level into a a braid or wrapped twist at the nape. Um, first time brides wore their lo their hair loose in a token of virginity and a wreath or a chaplet of orange blossoms was traditional. Uh, a jeweled wreath uh, with enameled orange blossoms was sometimes worn. Interesting, isn't it? Let's look at jewelry and accessories. Women of the early, women of the wealth wore gold chain and other precious jewelry, color like necklaces called carcanets, earrings, bracelets, rings, and jeweled pins. Bands of jewelers work were worn as trim by the nobility and would be moved from dress to dress and reused. Large brooches uh, were uh, worn to pin over the, part, the partlets to the dress beneath. Dress hooks of silver kilts, gilds of the wealthy and metal base for the lower classes were worn to hoop, loop up the skirts. A fashionable accessory was a zibellino and a pelt of sable or marten worn draped at the neck and hanging at the waist. Some costumes uh, historians call these flea furs. The most expensive zibellini was uh, faces and paws of goldsmith's work with jeweled eyes. However, it should be noted that not all women or men were allowed to wear jewelry because of the uh, sumptuary laws and re that restricted the wearing certain types of jewelry and luxurious fabrics such as purple or velvet to first royalty and then nobility. Hmm. The newly 
wealthy merchant classes who were not an aristocrats could not wear jewelry on their clothing or fabrics restricted to nobles uh, gloves of soft leather had short and sometimes slashed cuffs and were perfumed how lovely now let's look at beauty ideals because it has changed a lot over time portraits produced during the renaissance provided in an uh, invaluable resource for visualizing and understanding the beauty ideals of the period sandro Botticelli's Venus and Mars, painted in 1480s to 1490s, depicts Venus as an ultimate amalgamation of female physical beauty. Her face is perfectly symmetrical, her skin is unblemished in pure white, her hair is light in color and slightly waved, her forehead is high, her eyebrows are severely arched, and her lips are red and full and her abdomen and hip protrude slightly under her thin garment. Uh, women often applied toxic substances to their faces and chest, uh, such as mercury, alum, and cerus, uh, cerus, I think, to lighten the skin to remove the freckles. However, these products, such as cerus, a lead derivative, uh, uh, severely irritated the skin, leaving the woman's face blemished or burnt. Although several alternatives existed, women preferred consistently and covered uh, coverage offered by Carus. <laughs> Not all uh, cosmetics were dangerous. Many women relied on lotions and balms containing almonds, olive oil, lemon juice, breadcrumbs, eggs, honey, rose water, and snake fat to clarify and cleanse the skin. Red lips and rosy cheeks were achieved primarily through the application of a vermilion carous mixed with organic dyes such as henna or cochineal, a, a powder made from a ground exoskeleton of insects. A, in uh, Italy, especially, women sought to achieve the light tresses that were viewed as an ideal. Women applied mixtures of lemon juice, alum, and white wine, and sat in the sun to lighten their hair <laughs> in order to produce loose curls. Women wrapped their saturated uh, hair saturated in gum arabic or beer. Uh, around clay curlers. And finally, the appearance of high forehead was achieved by plucking hairs along the hairline and severely arching and removing the eyebrows altogether. Uh, uh, although at this time women could not cosmetically alter the symmetry of their faces and the structure of their nose in order to obtain ideal and product available allowed to them to come to close. That's why a lot of the portraits women's faces have looked, it just looks like they have very minimum to zero brows. That was the ideal beauty by the, back then. Uh, browless face sounds kind of not nice for me right now at this era. I think um, it's not a modern ideal mm, and hairline they would pluck their hairlines to re reveal more of a forehead which is totally opposite of what what we have these days um, I wouldn't I mean if you are looking into the Renaissance and medieval pictures of ladies they do really look like very long, big-headed people compared to their bodies and really looks like an egg-shaped faces, I think. It's, it's the ideal back then. And one thing good about this, uh, women's bodies were expected to be fuller and more curvaceous. <laughs> um, now... Let's uh, let me tell you more about the beauty.
beauty ideals, style, gallery, a German states and low countries in 1500s to 1520s. Number one, Anna Kospinian uh, wears a rose pink brocade gown with high belt and black collar and cuffs with a, a large headdress 1502 to 1503. Let's drink mine. Mm. Number two, Saint Dorothea wears a black collar or round partlet over a gown with organ pleat skirt and snug bodice trimmed with embroidery. She wears paste sleeves derived from Italian style with cuff at the elbows and shoulders, heavy gold chain and a gold filigree carcanet and neck necklace in fifteen oh six. Number three, Duchess Katharina von Mecklenburg wears a front-laced gown in the German fashion with broad band of contrasting material, tight sleeve slashes at the elbows, 1514. Mm. Number four, three ladies in German fashion, 1525 to 30, berets with upturned slashes, Brim are worn with cauls and sleeves are variously puffed pieced slashed with an a short wide cuff extending over the hand. Number five, Katharina von Bora wears a long laced greyish gown with black trim. She wears a white partlet edged in back and her hair is concerned conferring a fog confined in a net or snood 26 1526 mm. <clears throat> number six a princess Sibyl won cleaves as a bride wears a tight a waisted gown with slashed and puffed sleeves over a high necked chemise with a wide band at the neck, her loose hair, and a jeweled wreath beneath the um, orange blossoms indicate that this is a bridal painting. 1526. Absolutely, absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful bride. And seven. Widows in the Netherlands wear barbs or wimples with line, linen headdresses. 1526 to 30. Women uh, spinning, number 8. Women spinning of 29. 1529 wears a linen cap and hood and black partlet. Characteristics of middle class costume in the Netherlands in the 1520s. It is very hard for me to say 15, 1520s, 1526. I automatically say it 1926, 1920s. <laughs> now let's look at the style gallery, German states and little countries in 1530s to 1540s. <laughs> we will definitely look at Anne of Cleves for sure, but let's look at Christina of um, Denmark, Duchess of Milan in mourning, number one, wears a black robe with a fur lining over a black gown. She wears a close-fitting black cap, 1538. Number two, German fashion includes high-waisted gowns with wide sleeve trimmed with the black, uh, with band of contrasting fabric worn with white belt. Under sleeves probably attached to the kirtle have ruffled cuffs lined in red. Black parlette is worn and headdress consists of a decorated cap and a short sheer, sheer veil turned up in wings at the other cheek. 1538 to 39. Now, number three, Anne of Cleves. Alright. Anne of 
cleaves, wears red gown with high waisted confines with a belt. Her sleeves have broad cuffs at the um, at on the upper arms and wide, often lower sleeves. Her cap or hood has a sheer veil draped over it. Fifteen thirty nine. So Anne of Cleves was, I believe, she was the. Uh, Catherine. Oh my goodness, I'm losing. Co <laughs> That's so many wives that he had. Uh, Catherine, and Anne, and. Uh, oh my goodness, what's the third wife? Anna and number two. Yes, she's the fourth wife of Henry. So, that, that was the first picture that Henry saw and fell in love with. Ah, oh, his fluttering heart. Number four, Anne of Cleves again wears a long a front lace full sleeve gown of bands of red gold brocade and black wood ruffled cuffs with display of chemise cuff beneath. Her headdress consists of a short sheer veil, an embroidered hood, and a red undercap or forehead band is visible at the temples in fifteen forties. So now this is this is um when she was back in England uh, for one year already, after probably after the divorce, uh, annulment, whichever. Mm -hmm. She's yep, right. So uh, number five, woman holding a silver rosary, wears a linen headdress and a veil. Her gown is confined with a wide belt at the high waist, and she wears black parlets, partlets that reveal a red kirtle over her high-necked chemise trimmed with gold embroidery in 1542. Beautiful. Number six, Flemish costume of 1542 features turned back trump trumpet sleeves lined in fur and black partlets. The high-necked chemise of fine linen was ruffled at the wrist, and a linen hood with veil is worn. Number seven. Um, Christoph of Berger's unknown woman wears a finely pleated par partlet or high-necked chemise with high collar and small ruff beneath her gown. Her close-fitting cap may be similar to that worn by Anne of Cleves under her veil, circa 1945. Uh, Self-portrait of uh, Katharina van uh, Hemesson shows the painter in black over partlet and vel red velvet under sleeve, 19, uh, again, 1548. <laughs> Not nineteen. Yeah. Now let's look at the uh, Italy and Spain portraits. Um, let's listen to it. Probably I will not put in all these photos because it is very hard to keep track of everything. So let's do this. Um, I, I like the Italian uh, style during these times because I can see the hair. It looks gorgeous because it was probably very hot in Italy to be wearing velvet all the time during the summer times. So that they will leave the hair in a net or leave it loose. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Number one, Maddalena Doni wears a rose-colored gown with contrasting blue sleeves. She wears a sheer color shoulder cape, or often partlet with dark edging, 1505. Number two, Spanish fashion. A velvet gown with slashed sleeve is worn over a chemise embroidered in black. 
still get the neckline visible beneath the net partlet and in bands down the white sleeve told the OC 1505 Venetian woman wears a patterned gown with tied on sleeves and shows the chemise um, and beneath her hair frames her face in the soft waves and black hair uh, is confined in a small drapes cap C1505 Barbara Pallavicino um, wears a slashed sleeve tied in bows at the shoulders uh, her hair long hair is confined in small embroidery cap and then wrapped in a long tail down her back she wears a, a fillet or, or a thraneri around her forehead Italian gown of floor silk was wide, puffed, has wide and puffed under sleeve and fitted lower sleeve. Her chemise is high necked and small frills are visible at the wrists. She wears a heavy gold chain. And Joanna of Aragon uh, wears a gown with wide open sleeves lined in pink, light pink. Her high waist is accentuated with knotted sash. The full sleeves of her chemise are gathered into ornament bands and she wears a broad hat that matches her gown in 1518. Margaret de Angoulême, I'm sorry I have butchered the name, wears Italian style common in Savoy. Her black gown has very large puffed undersleeve with white lining pulled through the numerous cuts and slashes. Her hair is confined in a black bag-like fabric snood under the broad black hat 1527. Absolutely the iconic 15th century, 1500 clothes, iconic royal slashed clothes, very beautiful. Now let's look at uh, Italy and Iberia in 1530s to 40s, Elena of Austria. Queen of Portugal and France wears floral cut velvet gown with fur lined over sleeves over full uh, striped slashed under sleeve caught up with jewels in 1530. For she's Italian lady wears pink gown with puffed under sleeve and contrasting velvet lower sleeves both trimmed with fur. She wears high necked chemise or possibly partlet trimmed with black work embroidery at the neck and front opening her girdle of the knotted cord has a tassel at the end so 1530s to 35 uh, Tutian's it Italian lady wears a gown with puffed undersleeve over contrasting slashed uh, lower and undersleeve she wears a jeweled girdle at her natural waist her hair is done up in intricately knotted braids in 1536 now let's look at english and france fashion in 1500s and 1520s number one elizabeth of york who is uh, the mother of uh, henry the eighth and arthur his brother, uh, I do not know Arthur the first or what, no, I don't think so. Uh, Elizabeth of York wears an uh, early gable hood and the front closing red gown with fur lining and a trim and fur cuffs in 1500. Um, Number two, an unidentified princess believed to be Mary Tudor or Catherine of Aragon wears a round hood over a linen cap and a dark gown over a kirtle. Her square-necked smock was, has a narrow row of embroidery at the neck and she wears a jeweled collar at the carcanet and a long heavy gold chain circa early 16th. Um, really beautiful beautiful i believe that it was 
of Catherine of Aragon. Yes. And uh, um, hmm. number three, Henry the Eighth's sister Mary Tudor, marriage portrait of with Charles Brandon in the French gown shows shows the cuff of her sleeve turned back to display a lining decorated with pearls. She wears French hood. Her under sleeve has an open seam cord with jeweled clasps and pins. Her chemise sleeves are pulled through the openings of small gowns. 1516. Um, uh, Catherine of Aragon, 1525, wears a gable hood with a uh, uh, lapels fold up and pinned place and veil hanging loosely in the back. Her gown has a pattern of jewels at the neckline and her wide sleeves are turned up to show the lining. Um, Mary Watton, Lady Guildenford, wears a gable hood with loose veil and the bodice of her gown presumably laced at the back side or back is decorated with draped chains and her smock sleeves are pulled through and open outer seam of her under sleeve and a neat puff. Um let's see so uh, this is very particularly the the gable hood uh, was such such a big influence from the early fifteen hundreds to the twenties to thirties um it was everyone was wearing the gable hood in the England. Um, now, uh, two ladies of uh, Thomas More's family wear dark gown laced over colored kirtles with contrasting undersleeves in 1527 28. Uh, Holbein's Anne Lovell wears a full fur cap shaped like gable hood. Uh, she wears a linen kerchief or camelette draped over her shoulder and a sheer parlet, 1527-28 drawing by Holbein um, I, yes, Holbein shows front and back view of English dresses and gable hood of 28-30 to 30. now, Holbein uh, was a very, very notable, popular artist, portrait artist during that time he drew, he, he drew the famous shapely drawing of Henry VIII and all of his wives probably so he was the man to call when you needed a nice portrait G number one now let's look at the 19, uh, 1530s to 1540s English fashion Jane Seymour wears a gable hood and a chemise with a geometric uh, black work embroidery, 36-37. Oh, Jane Seymour is the third wife, I remember now. <laughs> Details of the embroidery of Jane Seymour's cuff. Very detailed, absolutely beautiful. Margaret Wyatt, Lady Lee, wears a patterned brown and mulberry colored gown with full sleeve and matching partlets lined in white in 1540. Elizabeth Seymour wears a black satin gown with full sleeve and black velvet partlet. She, her cuffs are floral black work embroidery 40 and 41. <laughs> Lady Margaret Butts wear a high-necked chemise with a band of black work at the neck and the lapel lapets on her gable hood are solid black and she has a fur piece draped around her shoulder 43. Henry VIII's uh, daughter Mary Tudor, Bloody Mary, wears a brocade gown with red sleeve lining and the red French hood with black veil. The edge of her square-necked chemise is visible above the neck of her dress, 1544. Um, uh, when I think of Mary Tudor, unfortunately, I think of the Tudor's character lady of Mary Tudor, and she's an absolutely beautiful girl, and oh my goodness, really beautiful. 
and her favorite phrase is um, <laughs> a, a traitor was it something like I don't remember now but she's an absolutely beautiful actress absolutely opposite of Mary Tudor if you look at her photos her portraits photos no portraits uh, she was definitely definitely not as beautiful as that so not now let's look at Catherine Parr who wears a, a loose gown with uh, she's the sixth wife of and the last wife of Henry. Uh, loose gown with wide band of applied trim. She wears a white cap with pearls and pleated forehead cloth. Pleated forehead cloth under the hat with an upturned brim and feather. The color of her gown is lined with patterned woven and possibly embroidered silk in 1545. Last, last, last is Elizabeth Tudor at age 13 wears rose-colored gown over a four-part and undersleeve of the cloth of silver with patterns in looped pile. Her French hood is matching her gown in 1546. Now, this is the end of this video. I believe it was really loud with all the constructions outside, so now I will have to end this at this point because there's trucks outside. So I hope that you enjoyed today's history lesson because I certainly have learned quite a lot from this and I would love to make another one when there is a suitable time for me. I did embrace my little accent a little during this time because I have been watching a lot of the English documentary and sometimes when I watch a lot of things and when I interact with people from different countries or watch different shows from different ac with different accents it changes my accent so I hope you don't mind all right hope you have a good day and hope you are asleep right now goodbye